So um, I want to I wanna talk about, there's a prayer, and I think I shared this with you guys before. One of my favorite prayers of faith is out of Mark 9, 14 to 29, and it's where um, the father brings his son to Jesus, and he's like, Lord, if you can heal my son, and Jesus is like, yes, I can heal. Oh, you have little faith. But his prayer, and I use this prayer all the time, was, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's a prayer of faith. So um, I want to share that with you, and I want to give that to you um, as a prayer you can pray that as we're going through some of the beliefs here, that if you're not sure you believe it, but you want to believe it, that's a prayer you can pray. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And it's a prayer of faith. It is. All right. So my story of becoming free and responsible. So basically, the first 22 years of my life until I became a Christian, and actually for a little while after that, too, um, I grew up in a pretty loving home overall. But my kind of role, I know there's everybody has roles in their families. I was the responsible one. I was responsible for the peace of the household. I was responsible in my mind, right? I believed I was responsible for my mom being okay and not being upset. I believed I was responsible to communicate for my dad towards my mom. I believed I was responsible for my siblings all getting along. I really believed that. It was not good because it wasn't effective because it's not true. And then I was very irresponsible, not responsible for me. I really thought everybody else was responsible for what, how I felt, what I believed, um, you know. And I was a giant, insecure, people-pleasing person who was exhausted. But on the outside, I just looked like this. Lots of smiles, right? So when I came to Jesus, which I did in a communion service, so I love communion, I had um, gone to church with a friend, and it was a really small church. There was about maybe 30 people there, but they were raising their hands. And I thought, these people are weird. And they kind of were moving to the music. And I'm like, these people are strange. A few little judgments there. So I was just sitting there going, whoa, this is weird. I don't, I don't know if I like this, but they sure seemed happy. But anyways, um, at the end of the service, they went into communion like we did. And for the first time ever, I heard the gospel. And I heard about sin, and I was like, sin. Like, to me, I'd always thought, oh, sin is what you do wrong, and da 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 But sin actually is about missing the mark and missing what God has set out for us, that he's designed these amazing principles for living that, that give us a, a, an amazing life. And when I live apart from those, that's sin. I'm missing what he has for me. And I started to see, because I was actually a pretty good girl from the world standard standards, and I started to see, oh my gosh, I have, I have sin in my life. And my greatest sin was that I was my own God. So I, I remember thinking of the word self, and I was self-preserving and, and uh, you know, uh, self-protecting, like all of those things. And as I started to see that, it, it was like simultaneously as I was starting to see that, like the love of God was just pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. And I just, I didn't feel any condemnation. I started to see the love of God and my need for the love of God. And until that moment of, of being open and kind of inviting it, I never could see it. But as soon as I just even cracked that tiny little bit open to Jesus, is he real? Is, is your gospel really true? boom, I started to get this revelation of who God is and his goodness in my life. It was such a blessing, and it really began to um, shake me and, uh, and shape me. And at that, it was June 6, 19, I was going to say 24. That was, that was the year my mom was born. <laughs> no. June 6, 1984. There's a big difference. <laughs> That's funny. I think my mom's laughing up there right now. Um, and I'll never forget that day. And it was life-changing. And I still had a lot of mess in my life. I still have some mess in my life here and there. But I still had a lot of mess. But I got this relationship and this connection. And I started to experience freedom. And uh, it, was, it was such an amazing time. And, you know, some of you know my whole story, my whole testimony. And so... At that point in time when I became a Christian, I had been dating a fellow for uh, just about um, 
four years or something like that. And it was a very, like, you know, by the world standard, good, but by God's standard, bad, and, and actually really not emotionally healthy. Neither one of us were emotionally mature or healthy. It was extremely painful time. I ended up getting pregnant. I ended up having an abortion. It was so painful. There's about three months of my life that I still don't remember because I was so um, broken. And, and the thing was, I actually thought that I couldn't be a Christian anymore because of that. And it was so painful. And I think that's partly why I couldn't experience or can't remember that three-month period because I started to believe the lie that, you know, it was an unpardonable sin. And then Jesus met me. And he said, Donna, this is why I went to the cross. It's for these things. Are you going to receive my gift or are you going to give it back to me? And I started to see that, um, I, I, I began to see the fullness of that, but not only the fullness, but that that one terrible act didn't define me, but it also was a symptom of greater things, greater unmet needs going on inside of me and identity needs that I had, and identity needs that the fellow that I was dating with at the time too. And we did break up. But for both of us, it began a journey of really learning to walk with God, really coming to terms with this incredible gift of salvation of, by the grace of God, not by works, so none may boast. Like those truths began to settle in and set me free. You know, he who's forgiven much loves much. Those kinds of truths began to bring this incredible freedom in my life. And I loved the word of God. The wise person mentoring me said, read the Gospels. Let's go through the Gospels. Good thing they didn't start me in Leviticus, right? And those Gospels, I could just see the love of God at work and see the love of Jesus at work. And freedom just began to reign in my life. And I came up to Kelowna, September 1986, to go to Bible school at Okanagan Bible College. And I was 24 years old, met this guy. And uh, uh, neither one of us were looking for, uh, I wasn't looking for a boyfriend, and he was not looking for a girlfriend, but we became friends with a group of people. And uh, long and the short of it was we met in September, we got married uh, August 1st, so not even a year later, and uh, we've been married for 32 years this summer, which is pretty good, eh? Yay, that's so good. And I think a big part of that is that we were both really hungry for the reality of God and the freedom that we were reading about. Malcolm is a man of the word. He loves the word. Like, and his memory, my eyesight might be better, but his memory is better. <laughs> and his memory, he just go, oh, that's chapter, you know, that's Galatians 5, verses 7 to 8. And I'm like, it's in the New Testament, and I know I can find it if I have a concordance, right? <laughs> So I think we just appreciated that our, our relationship, our, each of our personal relationship with God and really our love for the word and his truths has really grown our marriage and our family. Um, I learned a lot in that season. We began to work at the church very quickly. I'm skipping a whole bunch of little things along the way. But anyways, um, we were and we were learning to have, you know, a healthy relationship with each other and learning about the freedom that we have in Christ and the responsibility that we have within that relationship and, um, and beginning to kind of share that with others. And then, so I would say that was my, like the first part was my, you know, 10s and 20s age and then my 30s and 40s. And now I'm in my 50s, moving into the 60s. I love being in my 50s. The 50s has just been a fantastic decade. I feel like I know who I am now and I go, mm, this is me you know, this is who I am, and I don't have to be perfect, right? None of us have to be perfect. We just get to be ourselves, and it's why we need each other, because none of us carry everything, right? So I'm really, like, content with who I am, uh, absolutely always wanting to grow. I think I'll be a lifelong learner, but I'm content. And, um, you know, Malcolm and I, we faced lots of challenges along the way, and um, lots of challenges in ministry, and um, have just tried to walk with God through that. And one, I remember one, I, I said to Malcolm, I remember this dream the Lord gave me, as most of you know, I'm a dreamer. And we were going through a big transition here. Malcolm had been the worship pastor for about 12 years here, and we were transitioning out of that role. 
and it was good. It was important. It was good for us and good for the church, but it was also hard. Like it was kind of scary. And, you know, I was like, Lord, did we do everything we're supposed to do? I feel like I just kind of felt shame trying to kind of come at me. And it was just awkward, wasn't it? It was a challenging time. So I have this dream. And in the dream, Malcolm and I are in the basement of this really, really, really big house. And we had done a bunch of renovations. And the landlord was walking through the house with us. And he's looking at the renovation. He's like, yep, this is good. This is good. They weren't fancy, but they were well done. And I could feel, oh, he's, he really likes what we've done. And we did a good job. And it was so encouraging. And then to my horror, all of a sudden, I see the windows. And all the casings are off the windows, you know. And it's all the jagged um, drywall and you know where all the the, the foam is supposed to be sprayed in Angus none of that was there it was all rotten and I could see this dirty water uh, rising up and I'm like oh no that's going to come in and I'm like oh, we didn't change the windows and the landlord comes over to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says oh no honey that's my job I'm like oh, oh bit of relief and he goes come with me comes over to this big cupboard opens this cupboard and it's full of these lush white robes and he throws one into my arms and he said these are yours and you can put one on any time you want and I woke up it's like oh, it still moves me 20 years later and what the Lord was saying to, to us was look you did what I asked you to do in that season you made the changes I wanted you to make basements for me are often about uh, hiddenness and intercession and things that are being formed and uh and he said the windows are mindsets that's my job that's not your job i didn't ask you to change mindsets i just asked you to do this i'll take care of it now here you go i clothe you in white so that you won't be ashamed and that dream has stuck with me anytime i start to feel afraid scared nervous you know as a leader sometimes you have to make hard choices and hard decisions and you have to talk about hard things with people so oftentimes when i was preparing i would stand there and i'd say jesus i just put on one of those white robes thank you that i don't have to be ashamed thank you that i don't have to be afraid i can just go in your love and we can have a conversation and um, you're going to meet that person's needs in a way that i can't even begin to so i began to learn about my freedom my responsibility but also his desire to help me in every way that I could possibly need and more. So um, one of the big things that we found out began to in that season also we can share with others what we're learning right and I learned something from a really good friend one time they said to me you don't all you got to know is one thing to pass on to somebody else and they're going to think you're an expert right so that's for all of us if we have one thing that God's given us, that's helped us, helped our lives, helped our marriage, helped our family, helped in any way in our life, we can give that away to others and it will make a difference because this is what I've learned. People are looking for hope, not for perfection, right? They don't need to know, like people will, as they get to know me, they realize, oh my gosh, you have challenging things in your life too because they can just assume, you know, they see you here or they see you you know, I'm like, oh, we all do. We all have challenges in our lives, right? But people find hope when you've found a way to walk through those challenges and learn about that um, and give that away. So um, we're going to look at being free and, uh, and, and responsible, and we're going to zip through some of these things um, really quick. Um, the dictionary, when it talks about freedom, it says enjoying personal rights or liberty, a person who is not in slavery, a land of free people, able to do something at will, at liberty, free to choose, um, having an immu immunity and being safe. And in reality, even though that's the dictionary, when I looked at the Bible, the meanings were almost identical in all the scriptures that I looked up. The blue letter Bible said um, it, being free is also means liberty and adds true liberty is living as we should, not as we please, right? Now, the word should, I'm kind of, mm, I kind of not like that word. I'm like, don't shit on me. I don't like that word. But what it means is it's the way God wants us to live. And again, we need to remember that every principle that god has for us every way that god has for us is motivated by his love for us and it's good so i never have to be uh, um, 
concerned. It's not the same kind of should, right? It's I should because of who Jesus is, because of his goodness, because of his love. Um, I, I can do that. So um, that's, that's where the freedom comes from. Responsible, being responsible is the state or fact of being responsible, answerable, or accountable for something within one's power, control, or management, reliability, and dependability. So I am responsible, answer, answerable, and accountable for my choices and my decisions. Is anybody else responsible for me? No, not even my husband. Darn. Is anyone else responsible for you? No. That's good news, people. It's actually good news. Why is that good news? We talked a little bit about it already. Because then I actually can make the choices I need, regardless of what anybody else thinks I should do, what anybody else's wisdom is for me. Doesn't mean I can't listen and glean wisdom, because wisdom can be found in the counsel of many, right? But I get to choose for my life because I am responsible. I alone am responsible for my decisions. So I can't say, Malcolm made me do that. <laughs> Bethany made me do that. My kids made me so mad. Like, no, I make myself mad by how I interpret the situations and, and how I walk them out. And I sure didn't like that when I first heard that. But now I love it because I'm free. And I'm free to make myself unmad. Do you know what I mean? It's so good. We're going to really zip through some of these free and responsible truths. But they're really important. Um, there's a book that we have, and I think some of you have, we've been using it as a base called the Kingdom Culture. It's by Dan Fairley, and it's Living the Values that Disciple Nations. If you want a copy of this book, we do have some in the office. You can talk to Amanda, but you can also get it on Amazon. It's very, very, very good. Uh, when I first looked at it, I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting to talk through. It looked a bit dry, but it actually invites you into a process of finding out what your own beliefs and message is for each one of those cultures. So I love it now. It's like I, I could create, you know, 13 messages to share in my life, whether it's at the church, in a relationship, all the rest of our family, and you can do the same. So uh, let's see. I just got to make sure that I didn't. I can't read my blue, my blue highlights. <laughs> there we go. All right, so slide 10, Justin, we're going to look at this truth. Christ died to set us free from sin, death, fear, and shame in order to establish us in freedom so we can live and love as God's glorious children. Is that good news? It is. Let's look, from, look at the Bible. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, freedom, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, and do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So can you see the free and the responsible in that verse, right? But we're free first. So if we don't grasp the freedom, it's hard for us to be responsible in a life-giving way, right? So we take on that responsibility because of the freedom we have. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Anybody know that song? Remember that song? The law of the spirit is life in Christ Jesus has set you free. Anyway, I know that song. I used to, because I didn't grow up learning scripture, I learned scripture through songs in my, in my 20s and 30s. So those really mean a lot to me. This understanding of just how free we are is crucial. It's like a taproot truth that we must take hold of in our walk and understand for ourselves so that we are free and we can bring that same freedom to others. Most people really get stuck in believing that they really are fully loved, warts and all, sin and all, through what Jesus has done, um, that what Jesus did was enough. And uh, most people really struggle with that. Um, several of you that I know have read through this book um, called How to Stop the Pain by Dr. James, James Richards, and he really hits on that. And he says, if we judge our identity by our performance, 
We will falter when our works do not prove who we are. Can our works prove who we are? No, they can't. Because we have failed to renew our minds, we still see ourselves to some degree the way we were before we got saved. Through our self-judgment, we determine that because we have unacceptable traits on the outside, our inside must be corrupt. That's not true. There is a hidden man or woman, a hidden man of the heart, a new person or new nature that we are not really in touch with yet or fully. Our self-judgments have kept him or her hidden beyond our perception. When the Apostle Paul talked about putting, on, putting an end to unacceptable behavior, he pointed to the fact that we have already been made new. But we must change the way we think in order to put on the new person, right? So what we believe about our newness matters because that's what will create our new our new belief will will create the new behavior the new behavior doesn't create the new the new belief right we don't need to become something new if we are in christ we do however need to get our thinking straight like a king with amnesia we don't need to become kings we simply need to remember that we are kings right we are supernatural royalty we are sons and daughters of the king. We need to understand this. This is part of where our freedom comes. There is a new you on the inside, a new me. You think you are not new because you still have the behavior of the old you. You never accept God's judgment on the old you. My old man is crucified with Christ. It's dead. It's gone. My old me is not alive anymore right the old sin nature was judged found guilty crucified died and was buried with christ do you believe that this is so important you are a new creation you are created in the likeness and righteousness of god the old is gone the new has come do you believe that it's hard to believe because it's so amazing we must spend time, okay, we did not get saved to squander our lives in sin and failure as we await heaven. No, we must persuade our hearts of this reality here on earth. We must spend time communing with Jesus in our hearts to create an ever-present awareness of his presence in our lives and the freedom that we already have because of him. Anybody here ever struggled with believing that? I sure have. You know, less and less all the time, but I sure have. What that means is I can, we can stop judging our old self and start believing who your new self really is because of Christ. But it's your choice, right? You get to decide if you're going to believe that or not. What are you willing to believe? Pray that prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. This is crucial to our freedom and to understanding that. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he's become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. From the Passion Translation footnotes, it says, This would include our old identity, our life of sin, the power of Satan, the religious works of trying to please God, our old relationship." Um, with the world and our old mindsets. We are not reformed or simply refurbished. We are made completely new by our union with Christ and indwelling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Yeah, do you? Will you choose to believe it if you don't or you're not sure? Again, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right? Slide 12. Freedom is very personal, but it is not self-centered. We have been given freedom so we may present ourselves to the Lord as a willing sacrifice, surrendered and ready to serve. In Romans 6, 5, it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Um, that's a really important one. How do I know if I really grasp the grace of God? T 
Titus 2, 11 and 12, God's, God's marvelous grace has manifested in person, bringing salvation for everyone. This same grace teaches us how to live each day as we turn our backs on ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles, and it equips us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. I've heard the phrase cheap grace thrown around, and I, I get what they're saying, but from my perspective, you know, is there really such a thing as cheap grace? No. I say grace is what grace is. Costly for Jesus and amazing for us. When we get the grace of God, the grace of God teaches us to say no to worldliness, no to sin, no to those things. It empowers me to do that. It makes me want to live a life worthy of the calling because I'm so overwhelmed by how amazing and by how good God's grace is. Doesn't mean I won't struggle, but when I struggle, I know that I can go confess my sins. He'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and I will have a way out. But the grace of God produces godly living. When I get that, if I don't get that, I've said that, you know, in discussions with people, I'm like, well, I can do this. It doesn't matter if I do that. Like, I'm under grace. I go, that's not what grace is for. That is not what grace is for. And what's our response to grace going to be? Oh, my goodness. All the more. We're so motivated by his grace, by his love, that we want to live a life worthy of what Jesus did on the cross for us, right? Does that make sense? It's beautiful. That's part of responsibility. Grace is part of our freedom. But how we live that grace out is part of our responsibility. It's not okay if we're living in sin, if we're stealing, cheating, having affairs, all that kinds of stuff, whatever, gossiping. It's not okay. That's not God's plan or heart for us. It hurts us, and it hurts the people around us. But we get to come to God, give him our struggle, receive his grace, and that grace will teach us how to come out of that and how to live godly and upright lives. It's an amazing exchange, amazing. Um, slide 14, freedom and responsibility are inseparable. We experience true freedom when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of self-control and use our freedom to bless others. I used to say, and I've said this to my kids, you know, every decision I make uh, affects Malcolm. I don't have to uh, consider Malcolm. I choose to because I love him. And every decision I make affects him. Every decision I make affects my children. And because I love them, I consider them. Now, every decision I make affects every one of you because I'm a leader in this church. So out of love... I am careful, choosing carefully how I live my life. Not out of fear. Out of love, because you guys matter to me. I don't want to bring shame to your name. I don't want to bring shame to my kids' names. I don't want to bring shame to my husband. It's a choice. Out of love, not out of fear. So important that we understand that. I'm motivated by love. We can be motivated by love. I don't have to. I want to. Do you see the difference? It's so powerful. Um, Galatians 5, 22, 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And in the um, um, Passion Translation, which I'm just loving these days, it says, never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Isn't that amazing? Limitless love, limitless joy, limitless patience, limitless moms. I know you know what I'm talking about, right? Limitless. All of those fruit are meant to be limitless. That's just so amazing to me. Do you believe that? Come on. Will you choose to believe that? And if you don't, pray that prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief.
Slide 15. Freedom is very valuable to God. He demonstrated this when he placed the sinful choice in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, it is not our goal to remove sinful choices from people, but to call them freely to love God and choose his righteousness. When we know God's love, again, we want to do what he wants us to do because we know that everything he wants us to do is good. It's good for us, right? It brings life. Um, Genesis 2.15, we see the story of the Garden of Eden. It's amazing to me that God put that choice in there. But that choice is another picture of the kind of freedom that God's given us. It's so important we understand that. John 14.15, Jesus says, Loving me empowers you to obey my commands. We're obeying not for acceptance, but from acceptance. Do you see the difference? One is workspace, one is proving, the other is the receiving the free acceptance, the free gift that God's given us. And we live our lives from acceptance, not for acceptance. He is forgiven much, loves much. Do you believe that? Right? Will you choose to believe that? And then you can pray, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And the last truth we're going to look at is... Um, that usually our dreams are too small. God has big purposes for us to extend his kingdom. As we submit our lives to him and become excited about seeing his dreams fulfilled, we are free to dream big dreams for our lives with him. Ephesians 3.20 uh, is the big prayer that Paul prays. So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and I pray, and he prays this amazing prayer for us. And then it goes into verse 20. It says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you to accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Do you remember the song we were doing early? earlier, I think it was at the beginning, that we'd be energized. That is amazing. Where does our energy come from? Our power, our strength, it comes from God. And it's there for us. We just got to receive it. Be aware and receive it. It's so amazing. I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to skip right down to... Um, Let's go to slide 20. Thanks, Justin. So the, the two key things I'm trying to help us see is that there's this freedom that we need to grasp, right? And when we grasp that freedom and, and, and believe it, our behaviors, how that comes out in our responsibilities, will match the purpose of that freedom. Does that make sense? It means I have no, tr no problem being accountable for the decisions I make. Now, even the wrong ones, you know what? Because we all screw up. We all make mistakes. But I know how to clean it up now. I know how to apologize. I know how to ask for forgiveness. I know how to clean up the mess. And we don't have to be afraid. And the thing is, God helps us even when we screw up. He says, I remain faithful even when you're faithless. Can you see how win-win it is with God? It's a win-win. We cannot lose. It's that amazing. He is that amazing. Let's stand together, and we're going to do these declarations. So just take a minute to look. And then we're going to say them out loud together. Okay, everybody ready? Hands on your hearts. Because this is something you're declaring before God and before man. Here we go. I am free. I am free in and because of Christ Jesus. I have God-given free will and free choice. I make choices motivated by God's love. I am free from shame and blame. I am responsible. I choose how I respond to life and people. I take full responsibility for my choices. I fearlessly clean up any messes I make with people. I am motivated by love from God, so, so love from and for God. 
Now let that sit just for a minute. Look at those words. And let Holy Spirit just meet you. I want you to think about if there's any areas of your life that you're not feeling that freedom or experiencing that freedom. And just open that up to God because you know what? He has it for you. He has it for me. We are free. He wants us to know truth that will set us free. Sarah Lynn, if you could come up wherever you are. Can we see you anywhere? Do you see anybody see Sarah Lynn? Back there? There she is. Prayer team, if you could come up too. You guys know who you are. Barb and team, come on up to the front. Our call for prayer this morning is for areas in your life where you are motivated by fear of circumstances instead of the Holy Spirit or instead of by, uh, by love. If there's any area in your, of your life you're not experiencing freedom in and you want to or not understanding the freedom that Christ has given you in general, come up. You can just start playing. Thanks, Erlyn. Uh, for healing of any kind, if you have physical healing needs, if you have emotional healing needs, anxiety, stress, anything like that that you're experiencing, relational healing needs, Jesus is here for all of that. He's here for all of that. If there's any areas in your life where you need to see the hope of God, we want to welcome you to come up this morning for prayer. Um, also, just a reminder that it is Community Sunday, so we have a lovely light lunch being served in the back there, or go out with some friends, have some fun with people that you maybe have wanted to connect to, but haven't. But we're going to pray, and uh, after we pray, come up for prayer, or you're welcome to go and enjoy the rest of your day. So let's just pray together. Father, thank you for the amazing freedom that you have given us through Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you even showed us when you said to the Father, Father, will you take this cup from me? But nonetheless, Lord, not my will, your will. Jesus, thank you that you showed us the way and that your responsibility to do what the Father needed that gave us the freedom that we have. Let that beautiful gift of love create abundant freedom in our lives. Anywhere we've been stuck, anywhere where we haven't believed truth, we welcome the spirit of truth to lead us into all truth right now. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom we have. Whoa. And that our responsibility comes as a fruit of that freedom. We can joyfully take responsibility. Whoa. And Father, I just thank you that, whoa, the liberty and the freedom we have brings joy, brings hope, brings peace. And I just release that over every one of us today, that we would go forth with hope, with peace, with joy. Whoa. And that we'd be just contagious in our environments bringing that hope and peace and joy to others. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so good. Let's just say that out loud together. You're so good. You're so good. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, church. I bless you. I bless your day. Bless your lives, your families. Come up for prayer. Get encouraged. Go for lunch. Enjoy one another. All right. Thank you so much.